Happy Wednesday, IB Nation Sports Talk. I'm Sean Styers. He's Jesse Styers. It's mailbag night. And I tell you what, Jess, I've been sitting in here looking at the questions. I got a lot queued up and ready to go. There's just all kinds of good stuff that we're ready to get out of here tonight. I want to know if there was a question for over under how many takedowns you'd have today. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Know what we'll you're leave that. About. We'll leave that to a different time. Yes, a much different time. <laughs> you're on a little bit of a time crunch tonight, so we will uh, we will just roll right into questions because again, there are a ton ready to go. You just star them up. You know, if you see some come in as we go, uh, we might kind of have to cut them off at some point. You know, just depending on things. Uh, where was that one? Tommy, Tommy comes in with a bad attitude right off the bat. Is it even worth my time to ask a question? Tommy, you had a couple good ones and we will start with this one. Assuming no injuries at the position and normal growth for their respective years, how much improvement must Luke Talich make in order to receive a greater than 30% of the safety snaps St opposite? It was, this was very wordy opposite <laughs> Xavier Watts. The thing is, they've got Rod Hurd coming in from Northwestern. And that's, you know, so we haven't got a chance to see him yet. You know, there are all these guys, including Talich out there this spring. I think it's going to have to be, you know, if, if he's better than Hurd, he's going to play. Let's put it that way. And they like him enough. You know, they've, they've seen enough from him that they felt comfortable enough to give Talich the scholarship, but I think that there is still more improvement that's have to that's going to have to be made, considering the fact that they're bringing in the grad transfer from Northwestern. Yeah, I mean, you have a grad transfer, and you also have a Don Schuler who's also been, you know, playing Correct. well at the position as well. Um, and so I think you know it's a it's a three way battle currently between Talich, Schuler, and and Hurd, and you know what. What he can do, honestly, I think to in order to get the the highest amount of snap usage or percentage uh, in response to the question is, I think he's just got to do everything he can to beat out a Don Schuler. I think he's got to be kind of the top of the younger guys, um, and I think that's going to ultimately help him get the most opportunity as possible because him and Schuler are basically the same. I believe they're both red shirt freshmen. And so I think right. in order to get good playing time, he he essentially needs to beat out Schuler, in my opinion. Yep. I agree. DK has a good one here. List your position room in order of confidence, offense, and defense. I think DK, Vince, and I will make a show out of this tomorrow. I like this. It's something I had been thinking about doing. So since you brought it up, I think we can spend more time on that than you know just a few minutes in the mailbag. I think Vince and I will expand upon this tomorrow. You good with that, Jess? I'm good with that. I forgot to check the men's score. They Ooh. lost. They lost. Damn. And they didn't cover the spread either. Yeah, it was it was a rough. They got off to a slow start. They got down seven and nothing. And, you know, like they'd kind of hang around within six or seven. And then Wake just kind of, you know, pulled away in the second half and just kind of one of those, one of those days. I think we'll, we'll we'll talk about more about that in a little bit. DK also this is a softball here. I'll just let Jesse hit this one out of the park. This is obvious. <laughs> Which IB staffer is le least likely to pick up a tab? Like, um, unfortunately, sadly, I'm gonna have to say Vince. Yeah, um, I won't even say sadly because I've been <laughs> on like a few years ago. I almost moved and took a job in a different city and Vince and another buddy of mine were allegedly taking me out for a couple of cold ones, you know, before I was leaving and uh, guess who made no offer, you know, to <laughs> pick up any part of the tab, let alone the whole tab. Yeah. Vince at a going away at a going away thing, Vince, Vince left me hanging. So 
I don't want to hear kids this as an excuse. That was a, a choice. He made the choice Weak. to have all those children. Weak. You know what Vince did for Jesse's graduation present? <laughs> After knowing Jesse for most of his life and coaching him in high school, he worked at Home Depot, so he bought some cheap Home Depot materials, glued them together, and made some kind of whatever it was. I don't even know what it Probably, you know, $2 worth of total, you know, material glued it together and was like, hey, Jesse, this is your graduation <laughs> gift. And then he tried to make off with all the cookies on the table that uh, we had bought to take, you know, like 20 cookies home to his kids from the graduation party. So sorry, not sorry, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> That's Vince. Okay. Salty question. Denbrock likes to coach games from the box. Long preferred coaching from the field. What's your preference and why? What would be your preference, Jesse? Uh, my preference would be from the box because I think you can see more. Uh, the best way I would put it is imagine trying to watch a game on the sideline with a bunch of six-foot giants. And then imagine getting like a bird's eye view up from the box where you can see the whole picture, I think, is a better way. And especially as an offensive coordinator – you need to see, you know, what the defensive line is doing, what the linebackers are doing, what the safety is doing, or sorry, the secondary is doing. I don't think you're able to see that from the sideline. So I would prefer being up in the box, but I would say the advantage of being down on the field is you get instant feedback from your players. And I think there's a, you, there's, there is, it's easier to communicate when you're not playing a game of telephone yeah. through the headset with your coaches. You, you directly can be down there. Um, at least when I played, like our defensive coordinator was on the sideline and we would come off and he would, we would draw, like if we, if they were throwing a scheme at us that we hadn't practiced yet, we would draw it up on a whiteboard on the sideline and discuss how we were going to fit it, you know, from a defensive perspective. So, you know, that's kind of the benefit of being on the sideline is the instant access to kind of dissect something that you weren't necessarily planned for. But I, I would I would prefer the box just because I think I could see everything better. I wouldn't be relying on what kind of everyone else is telling me, essentially. Right. I agree. Because, like, back in the old days, 25 or so years ago, they used to have, like, this, you know, like a cable that ran from the press box down to the field. And they would take still photos of the formations and, like, what things look like. And they would, like, they would literally, they would, like, slide the photo down the field so that they could see it. You know, like if if that's where they were coaching from, and I think that because of the fact that you get you know so a so much better view from upstairs, you can see the whole field, the way they're playing you, you know how they're shading, all this different stuff from up there. So I, I would go up in the box as well. Like I've stood on the sidelines, it's just you just don't see enough for my liking. Standing down on the sideline, even if you're standing, you know, right up next to the field and you're not behind anybody. So I would definitely go up in the booth if I had the choice as a coordinator, especially as a play caller. Good question, though. Interesting one from Sean Kelly. How many games do you give Jordan Batello to increase his production before he gets moved to second string? What do you think about that? Ooh, that's, that's a really good question because, you know, he, the, the Viper to me is still a question mark. And so... If it's not Jordan Batello, then who is it? Is it Junior Tui Alamaka? Is it um, oh, what's his name? I think it's Bo Bobakar. Treyor. Yeah. Treyor. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like Jordan Batello has had an open audition for some time now. And you know, when you consider Notre Dame's schedule to start next season of you know Texas A and M, and then I forget who's after that. Honestly, I think it's Northern Illinois. I mean, if he's not playing well in both of those games, I don't. I, I do think that you have to start experimenting around a little bit in terms of, you know, is is someone else going to be given the opportunity? Because sadly, the thing about Jordan Batello is it feels like we've been waiting on his moment for some while now, and it, it's a constant cycle of, you know, he doesn't really do much, kind of flashes at the end of the season a little bit that allows him to get momentum going into the next season. And then he doesn't really do much. And that cycle kind of keeps going over and over. I think they need consistent play at the position. 
ultimately. And so if he's not getting it done early, I don't see any reason why not giving someone like, you know, JT a chance behind him. Yeah, to answer your question, after AM, you've got Northern Illinois, Purdue, Miami of Ohio. So you've got like those are the first four games right there. You've got a you know really good opponent right off the bat, and then you've got two MAC teams and uh mid-tier Big Ten team in Purdue that you've got. And you know, the the names that you mentioned were the right ones, Tui Alamaca and Treor. And part of the deal, though, is it's not just how Matello is playing. They will be rotating guys in. So you'll also get to see as some of these other guys, you know, rotate in what they can do as well. And, you know, does does Jordan Batello need to step up and be a much more consistently disruptive guy at that Viper end? Of course he does. But part of it, part of the equation is as well. And, and the question that you still have to ask is, is he still the best option? You know, like that's that's going to be that's going to be a big part of it. Is Botello still the best option, regardless of maybe how he's producing? But again, you're going to it's not just going to be Botello on the field. You're going to see some of those other guys rotating in. So you'll get a chance to see against the same competition just exactly how they step up. But, uh, you know, I would say to answer your question, if you know, if one or more of those guys is gaining on him, then, you know, maybe he does drop down a little bit because that competition that you're going to see in games two, three, and four are the kind of games where a guy like Botello should just flat out be dominating. You know, like there's, there's, there's no excuse <coughs> in those kind of games. You know, right there. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sloppy Joe says he's a viper who doesn't put pressure on the quarterback. That's like a Corvette that goes here to 60 and 30 seconds. Yeah. You know, there's, but there is more to viper as well because there are coverage things and stuff like that. But you know, the point is he still needs to like in comparison to the guy who was there before him, Isaiah Foskey, that guy was putting pressure on the quarterback and that's just flat out. Jordan Vitello needs to be doing more of that. DK wants to know expectations for this year with Leonard and the schedule. Even at five, I think the playoffs are brutal to us. Got to beat 12, then four, then one, then number two or three. Okay, so let's He's, let's start off. Leonard and the schedule. What are your expectations for Notre Dame? Do you want me to go through it here real quick in terms of, like, so you start off with Texas A&M. Then, like I said, you got Northern Illinois, Purdue, Miami, Ohio. Louisville, Stanford, Georgia Tech, Navy, and then November 9th, you've got Florida State, November 16th, Virginia, the 23rd, West Point, Army West Point, and then Southern Cal to close out the season. So your expectations are blank, Jesse. My expectations are an undefeated team going into Florida State week. I think that once you clear – like the toughest opponent out of the first eight games is Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. But Notre Dame should win that game because they're just far, further along as a program. Their coach is further along. Their rebuild is further along. Like that that alone should get that. Like even if Texas A&M has a little bit better talent, you know what I mean? Like maybe a few recruits that have a few extra stars or whatever – I don't think that really matters. I I, I have to give credit to Notre Dame of being further along in the process. Like Texas A&M is continuously going through this rebuild. Notre Dame has stable footing. They're going into year three. They've played big games under their head coach before this. Like this, this shouldn't be as big of a game or a moment as maybe what it what it'll be for Texas A&M. And so as long as they're able to stay calm on the road and get over kind of those first game jitters and mistakes and things. That's the only game I'm worried about until Florida State. And so I think they should be undefeated going into Florida State. Um, and then, you know, between Florida State, Virginia, Army, USC, you know, Florida State and USC would be the only games I have doubt about. But I think that they should – I mean, I don't know what Slovis is going to be like for USC. And, of course, that being the last game of the year, they're going to be playing at their best compared to, you know, maybe at the beginning of the season when they're working some things out. So – if I'm Notre Dame, I have two games, you know, circled after Texas A&M, Florida State and USC. And I mm -hmm. think realistically, 
like I, 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 it's hard to say that you should go undefeated, but like this schedule is very set up in a way where I don't think going undefeated is horribly hard. Um, I think expectations should be one loss. I think two losses is when you start kind of looking at, did we lose to a team that we shouldn't have lost to? So I, I honestly think, you know, looking at it, you know, we're in March 13th, five months out. I, I think that a realistic expectation is, is 10 and two at the worst and undefeated at best. And one of the questions that will follow Marcus Freeman into this season that won't be answered until it happens is how much better are they on the road? How much more prepared are they? You know, how much more prepared looking are they on the road compared to this year? Because that's where they had, you know, look look at Clemson, look at Louisville. And I'm trying to think, you know, Duke was obviously much closer than anyone expected. NC State was close you know, until the rain delay anyway, and then they ended up pulling away after the rain delay. But the road is where they had their biggest issues last year. And they open up on the road at Texas A&M. They close on the road against USC. They do get that Florida State game at Notre Dame Stadium. But, you know, even though it's not technically, I mean, it's played in an, in an NFL stadium at a neutral site, the Georgia Tech game will be away from Notre Dame Stadium, and they've got to go to Purdue this year as well. So I think we're going to know pretty quickly if that has taken care of itself. But that's that's really, to me, potentially the only thing that could trip them up. I, I agree. Like 11-1, and one, I think, is a very basic expectation for this team based on the way the schedule lays out. And so they have every reason to believe they should be playing in the college football playoffs and you know like dk expanded on you know like get to the playoffs first and figure out what seeds you're gonna be i think it's you know like that's that's the biggest thing you like the thing is get to the playoffs and then you figure it out from there you know without even knowing who your opponents are going to be based on what seed you end up being take care of take care of week to week and get to the playoffs. I think I think you're right though. If if they finish worse than 11 and 1, it is probably because they lost to a team that they shouldn't have lost to. Yeah. And I want to um correct my statement. It was not Kadi or uh Slovis. It was um Miller Moss, that guy who carved up Louisville in the, in bowl, the bowl game, game the USC yeah. quarterback. That's yeah. sorry. I got I Slovis transferred to Pitt and then I think to BYU. I got him confused, but Miller Moss is the quarterback I'm talking about because I think a lot of guys are high on him because of the performance that he had against a good Louisville defense. Like that was that was all of Louisville starters. And that guy, you know, threw for like five touchdowns, I want to say. No, six touchdowns and 370 yards. So, you know, USC and, and Lincoln Riley are, are going to be, you know, they're just not going to go away. They're going to be a good offense, right? And so when Notre Dame's playing them at the end of the season – it'll be a lot better than probably the bumps and bruises that USC kind of goes through at the beginning of the season. They'll be yeah. kind of clicking on all cylinders by that point. That's kind of always the way it is when they finish at USC. Like what you think about what USC could be going into the season is going to change drastically by the time you go out there and play them in game number 12. So Tommy wants to know, assume the mic and the helmet rule gets passed. I'd imagine coaches will still work on signals just in case. In case. How much time do you spend on the signals? Do you mix signals in or only when needed? What do you think about that? So I, I imagine the only way that signals will get worked on is like in case of emergency. Like for some reason, say the that like the telecoms aren't aren't working. Like we've seen this in the NFL before. Like quarterbacks have had to switch out helmets because you know their 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 comm system isn't working. I don't if it gets past, I don't see a lot of time being set you know spent on signals i think honestly you would see more of the old school route of like a wide receiver running in Just a running in place to yeah. a quarterback i don't think you'd go back to signals I, I i don't think it's something that you would practice because you're not i mean you're not anticipating that the communication stuff is going to fail and then if it does largely they have a backup helmet ready to go too right and so say all of that goes to crap then i think you just like i said go back to old school of a wide receiver running in the play. I don't think you would really mix in a lot of signals, but that honestly, that's just coach preference at that point. Are they more comfortable with trying to, cause it's like, are we going to commit all this time to signals for something we might never use? 
Right. Or is it much easier just to say, hey, you know, wide receiver, here's the play. Let's run it in and get it going. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's something that basically everyone has done at all levels of football. Old school is the way you put it. And that's, yeah. that's what it is. Just literally give the play to the wide receiver and have them run the play on. And, you know, another receiver comes off and, and – Basically, the receivers just shuttle on and off <laughs> every play. You know, funny it's, I think story that's though. Easiest. In high school, we had we had wide receivers run in our plays, and uh, my during my junior year, we had a really smart, savvy quarterback. He wasn't like most athletically gifted, but was just a really good quarterback. Uh, could read defenses, etc. And uh, I remember we were talking. I can't remember if it was after the season or you know whenever this was, but he told me that <laughs> he didn't know if it was the head coach calling in the wrong play or if the play somehow was jumbled from the wide receiver by the time. Like the game of telephone? <laughs> yeah, it was like the game of telephone. What Did it come from the source or did it come from the wide receiver running onto the field and forgetting something? But essentially what he was saying is he would have to kind of uh, call his own audible if a play got to him and he was just like, what? Like, that doesn't make, yeah, like yeah. that doesn't make any sense. So I thought I that was always that. funny. I can see that. You know, high, especially like high school and below, you know, Pop Warner, you know, what middle school, whatever it happens to be. I can I can see those guys easily messing that up. It'll probably still happen even in college if you have to do it. But I think that you rely on like the fact that, well, you're at Notre Dame and you're in college and, you know, you would hope that maybe they would retain a little bit more. But at the same time, you know, like when you're, you know, like you know, X fly Z, you know, whatever. Like, I think that there are, are plenty of opportunities for, for guys to kind of get some of that jumbled up in translation. Right. Right. DK wants to know outside of quarterback, name a player that you say we're in trouble. If they go down, he says, trick question is I think we're as deep as we've been since Lou. This is a tough one. Um, Hmm. Defensively, I'm not really worried. I think the defense has a ton of depth. While I would be concerned if Drake Bowen goes down and K KVA has to start as a true freshman, I think that would provide a lot of um, conflict. Just because I've gone through this before. It's one thing to be talented, but you still as the middle linebacker are setting the entire defense. Like you're, Half of your responsibility is is making sure that you're calling everything correctly and getting everyone else, you know, set correctly. So I do think that would be pretty, you know, pretty detrimental if we're being honest, losing the the captain of the defense. Um, and then if we're, if we're talking offensively, I would say, I would say it's never good to lose your blindside tackle. And I would say that when it's someone as highly touted as, Charles Jagusaw, then I, I think that would also be because then you, you'd really be piecing together an offensive line that hasn't played much together, right? And then losing kind of your best player on the offensive line and, and the most important position on the offensive line, I think that could provide troubles as well. But there's so much depth at running back and wide receiver that if one yeah. of them went down, I'd just be like, all right, well, it's the next guy up type situation. My thoughts exactly. E even though we haven't got the chance to see – these wide receivers perform to, you know, most of these guys perform together yet. They've got so, so much experience that they've brought in and, and even experience that they had on the roster as well. And they've got complete confidence in the running back room. I think you always have confidence in the tight ends room because it's basically just passed the baton for, from year to year. And Jagasaw was the first one that came to mind just because he's the left tackle and you're going to have someone completely inexperienced potentially that you'd have to throw out there in the middle of the game. Defensively, to start off the season, I would probably go with Watts just because maybe we'll feel different about it. We probably will feel different about it by the time the season actually starts. But again, so much relative inexperience and unknown next to Watts back there at safety. And the guy was the defensive player of the year last year. So like that would be that would be the guy that I would worry about the most like that would be the biggest concern if Watts went down, especially early in the season. Yeah. I mean, because if, if, uh, if Watts gets hurt, I mean, it's a good point. You're losing the guy who won defensive player of the year for college football last season. Um, 
wasn't all American. And then at that point, you're probably starting potentially two redshirt freshmen at both of the safety positions, assuming, you know, Hurd didn't play one of them. It would be between Schuler, Minnick, and Talich, you know, as a guy who would definitely get a, a starting role at that point. You'd be starting essentially kind of a true freshman at safety. But I'm sticking with left tackle. Tommy wants to know, more important position, left tackle or center? Um, Left tackle. I think center has more responsibility, but in terms of who's actually more important, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole documentary, you know, dedicated to the blind side tackle. <laughs> well, not a documentary, but a fictional, yeah. semi semi autobiographical. Well, you know, also like also like look at order, NFL right? salaries and and tell right. me who's who's. There's more a reason. Important. There's a reason left tackles are the ones that get draft, you know, picked at the top of the draft and not centers. Center is the least premium position of any position on the offensive line. Now, I mean, you can obviously make a case because of the fact that they're making line calls and all that different stuff, but you can also help that guy out, especially if you've got experienced guards around him as well. You know, the biggest thing with the center is just get the ball to the quarterback. I mean, look at the Alabama quarterback. <laughs> that was an issue, but I would still put the left tackle um, over the center. So I'm going to put a spin on this crying belly question. He showed up, you know, he's got his negative Nelly question. Let me just ask you this, Jesse. As of today, do you think there's any way Notre Dame will bring in another transfer quarterback in 2025? I think there's a way. I don't, I don't, I think there's two a, options. A guy who's expected to compete to start. Let me put it that way. An experienced guy like a Cone, a Hartman, a Riley Leonard. Do you think, scale of 1 to 10, what chance do you give Notre Dame to, to go to the portal again a year from now? Three and a half out of 10. Okay. So like a 35% chance. I The only thing that's, that I can't say no because they've, they've done it the last two seasons, right? And so, like, it's a track record. But as, as the question implies here, you know, it, what their justification would be. I don't, I think those guys are going to be ready behind them. Essentially. I think that out of Carr, Minchi and jelly, someone will be ready for next season. And I think the only way they go to the portal realistically right now is if they need a roster spot, potentially to have, you know, four guys on roster or potentially another guy, you know, just another scholarship quarterback. But I truly believe between Angeli, Menchi, or Carr, one of them will be the starter for the 25. I do too. I do too. I think that they're at the point when you look at the quarterback recruiting that they have put together, I do think that they are finally at the point where it's like, you've got to start rolling your own guys out there. You're recruiting these higher level quarterbacks. You've got to get them on the field. They've got to get ready to go. And I think that they will be starting – a homegrown quarterback next year. So I give it a one. I put it, you said three and a half. I give it a one that they would go back to the portal again next so year. So to kind of follow up with this, it, it the question is implying, you know, Riley Leonard not knowing the playbook compared to Steve Angeli. You know, we've gone through this before. They're both so, learning at the same rate. They're both learning at a, at a brand new. They both have a new offensive coordinator. Mike Denbrock, they're not running the same offense that they ran. It's all new now. It's right. a completely new and system And so I have a everybody. hard time believing that Angeli, a guy who's never been a starter, is going to process and learn a playbook at a faster rate. Or sorry, at as not as fast as a rate compared to Angeli, who's only made one start in his entire career against a C team defense in a bowl game. So right now, I guess what I'm getting at is there's nothing, nothing showing that Riley Leonard is going to struggle with the, the playbook compared to Angeli when they're both starting a new offense together at the same time. Yeah. I concur. I concur. Decaf wants to know where Vince is. You can ask that cheapskate tomorrow when he's in here, like every <laughs> Wednesday, it seems like these days he's got a reason he's got to be off. It's like, I got to do this and I got it. I don't even know what it is anymore. I can't track, keep track of all the reasons. Vince will be on the show though tomorrow. They had to, they, Jesse and Vince swapped tonight 
because of whatever is on the cheapskate's schedule. So <laughs> you can ask the cheapskate tomorrow when he's in here. And you can tell him that I called him a cheapskate, and he probably won't even try to deny it. He knows it. It's his blood. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he's he's still our cheapskate. But yeah, John, like it's as if John knows Vince because Vince is cheap. <laughs> There's just no way around it. Like, and again, I don't even think he would try to deny it because he knows how cheap he is. Tommy wants to know if you ever considered following my footsteps and joining the military. No. <laughs> Flat out. I thought about like, uh, you know, I, I take that back. I thought about potentially being in the Navy, but then I got like too big and I was like, there's specific height and weight <laughs> requirements you know, to because like the naval thing, like it's it's more of like I thought of it as a cool challenge because like you have to be smart enough to do that sort of stuff, right? And so like, and I you know seeing some of those Top Gun movies, I like it'd be kind of cool to like. So you were thinking about you wanted to be Tom Cruise and be a naval aviator and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. I thought that you if, to fly if, jets and yeah, and if I were that. to do it, that's the route I would go. Like I would okay. not be a ground. I wouldn't be you know army like you or marines like you are. You know your dad, my grandpa. Right. Um, but, you know, it was and Tommy. It, it felt like here's how I always thought about this, because I've th I've actually considered this a good amount. It always felt like that uh, the family kind of had expectations that, you know, not that the military is bad, but like we kind of did our time. So like you could flourish and prosper like you shouldn't have to go through the military like our generations have gotten better. You know, hopefully you are smarter than what, you know, you and or, my grandpa were. And so like, that was kind of like the means of method Like you went to, into the military so you could eventually go on to school. It was for me kind of like, all right, well, it, you know, you, we, we've set you up to be smarter. So you wouldn't have to use the military as a resource type situation. That's how I always kind of looked at it. Okay. Tommy also wants to know with coach Tony Alford going to Michigan, he left the M out of course, Notre Dame will finally be able to beat him specifically for recruits, commitments, and signatures. I don't know. I don't know what's going on up there in Michigan. Like, I, I, I will say this. I'm not totally surprised from what I've heard in the last few months that Tony Alford would go to Michigan. So I think he'll do just fine. I, you know, he he did well at Ohio State. Michigan didn't recruit well as well as Ohio State, but now they've got Tony Alford that they're bringing in. So I think that that's going to help him. But I'll say Notre Dame. I'll say Notre Dame wins more battles now that he's at Michigan than when he was at Ohio State. Put it that way. I think he'll do better at Michigan than compared to Ohio State. Honestly, I didn't even know that he was up there now. I think that is still kind of a thing in progress. I haven't seen whether or not that is official, but I have seen the reports that it's happening. So an interesting one. All right, Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? Is it that time already? It is. It is. And there's there's a couple things I think that I've still kind of got queued up that I might work into rapid fire here. Uh -oh. But ESPN is predicting a tight end to be Notre Dame's breakout player this season. Is it more critical to their success to have a breakout tight end, wide receiver, or running back this year? Um, I would have to say it is more crucial for their success that a wide receiver be the breakout player on the offense. And I have to say that ESPN picking tight end was a sleepy and lazy answer. Anyone could just slap on tight end on Notre Dame and say, that's the breakout player because what gets drafted at Notre Dame? Tight ends. ends. So they have a breakout it, tight end like every other year on average. Right. So they you know? spent like 30 seconds on this question and they're like, oh, yeah, tight end. That's that's uh, that's the easy one. But they definitely need a wide receiver. I, we talked about this. Denbrock had 2000 yard receivers at LSU last season. Um, Notre Dame hasn't had a thousand yard receiver. And I don't know how many years. Chase Claypool 2019. That was the last one. If Notre Dame wants to have success and be serious in the big games, you know, Texas A&M, Florida State, USC playoffs, however far they get out in the playoffs, they need a stud wide receiver. They need someone that, hey, it, on a 
on a third and three, we know our guy is going to win a quick slant and we're just going to put the ball on him and, and pick up the first down. You know what I mean? Just, yeah. just a guy, you know, is, is going to do that. Like it, 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 the, to me, the honest comparison is like when the Cowboys got rolling this last season, everyone knew CD lamb was going to catch the ball, but they couldn't stop him. That's what, that's what Notre Dame needs. It's just, a guy that you know is going to get the ball, that's their playmaker, but you really can't do anything I mean, about it. That's what Michael Mayer was a couple of years ago. Yeah. But Michael Mayer doesn't have the breakaway speed of a wide receiver. So there's a big difference if it's a tight end versus a wide receiver. And that's why it needs to be a wide receiver, because you're going to get more explosive plays if that go-to guy is a wide receiver as opposed to a tight end. As great as tight end and as great a pass catcher as Michael Mayer was, you can still only be so downfield when a tight end is the consistent go-to guy. And that's why it needs to be a wide receiver. Because even in even in the running backs room, like a couple of those guys are going to step up and I and they're going to be great. And you're probably going to have a couple of running backs, just like two years ago when it was Estime and Diggs, you're going to have a couple of guys pushing for around a thousand yards. But you know, like the way that that Dylan McCullough has broken that up, he's got all these different jobs that he divvies up, and so you're going to see, a, you know, a, a handful of guys who are going to be getting it. But they need a they need to be more vertical. Marcus Freeman knows that. Mike Denbrock knows that. That's why they went out and brought in guys like Chris Mitchell and Bo Collins. And so it absolutely has to be a wide receiver that needs to be the breakout guy. The closest thing they've had to a thousand yards since that Claypool season, was uh, Kevin Austin, 888 yards in 2021. So they need they need a receiver to start, uh, to start hauling the groceries a little bit more consistently. Fill in the blank. It is blank that ESPN has picked Notre Dame as one of the 10 teams they believe can win the Women's Basketball National Championship. To me, it's not surprising that ESPN has picked Notre Dame as one of the 10 teams that they think can win the women's national championship. Um, had you told me this a month ago, I would say that they were crazy, but the women's <laughs> right. team ended on a stretch that no one else in the country can really say. I mean, they beat Louisville ranked team. They beat Virginia tech winner of the ACC regular champ season championship with a, a healthy Kitley. They go on to beat Louisville, Virginia tech um, and North Carolina state in the ACC tournament. That's five straight, ranked wins. I've talked about it before. The Notre Dame women's team is good at home. They're good on the road. They're good at neutral places. And realistically, they have one of the top scorers in the country in Hannah Hidalgo. And the thing that separates them the most is they're playing elite defense down the stretch. And so right. you combine a player that can lead the nation in, the, in, in scoring, you know, be a top five player in the nation in scoring, lead the nation in steals, and then a really good defense on the back end it's going to be hard to beat a team like Notre Dame. And then you throw in, you know, the experience that they had outside of the ECC. They've played really good teams outside of conference play, and they've won some of those games. So it, when you're looking at a resume of someone who's been, quote unquote, battle tested during the regular season, Notre Dame is very well battle tested. They just kind of had to work out some synchronization issues of injuries and, you know, who the team was going to run through and et cetera. But they're playing really great defense right now, and I think that's going to get them a long way in the tournament. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we talked about it this week. They've held opponents to a little over 56 points a game during the eight-game winning streak that they're on right now, and uh, they're not just doing it against anybody. The last five teams they've played have been ranked, and they've all been repeat opponents, you know, so you've got scouting reports on each other and everything else, and they're still holding them to that, and, you know, it just shows how far they've come over the course of of the season and really how good they can be. And, you know, again, like you talk about, you know, we know what they can be offensively, but defense has been the difference. And as ESPN pointed out in this little paragraph that they wrote, that those teams that they played in the streak have all been different, you know, distinctively different kinds of teams as well. So they've, they played great against, you know, different, different styles of offense and 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 still been able to score against different styles of defense as well. You know, is depth an issue? Sure. But, you know, that's mainly if they get into foul trouble and that kind of stuff. And as we've talked about, they've won national championships before 
using just six players in the rotation. So I you know, just they can hope do it. that uh, those – sorry not to cut you off, but those ACC refs from the tournament sh should not be invited to the NCAA <laughs> tournament. So many whistles and fouls. Man, and it was like – it's it's just crazy how you know like how how differently they can start calling a game from one half to the next because things were you know they were they you know one minute they're letting them play and then maybe they're like oh we've we've let this thing get too far out of control and now they're calling a bunch of stupid stuff you're you're exactly right you know but that's that's an issue i think it at all levels, <laughs> unfortunately. But, you know, I think really the, the fact that they've showed themselves to be more than capable as a zone defensive team as well, I, I think, you know, especially against some of these more athletic teams like an NC State the other day, when they can go to zone, you know, what obviously you can start getting hurt if, if, if the other team gets hot from beyond the arc. But Notre Dame is also the, you know, they were the best three-point Defensive team in the ACC, 26th in the nation in three-point defense. The best, the the fourth best power five team in the nation in uh, three-point defense. You know, so the tournament's all about matchups, and they get the right matchups. I think that they can. Uh, I think that they can do it. I, I really do. I think the it's main thing for them is, I hope that they can get a three seed and avoid a potential one versus four in yeah. the Sweet 16. I think that's yeah. what's going to go a long way for them. Yeah. And I think they will. I know a lot of people are talking about a number two. I think that – I think three is really realistic. It's going to be um, – it's going to be really interesting to see what the committee thinks of them when everything comes you – know, that road win. You know, like you mentioned, they've been – like the fact that they have road wins at UConn and at Tennessee – this year, I think can potentially go a long way. And even like, you, you know, winning at Duke and at Florida State, those kind of things, I think, can go a long way. So I think that they've got a really good shot at being the number three. And I think, just like you said, I think that that's going to be vital, avoiding that number one and, you know, having a two, three matchup potentially instead. Well, the men's team saw their season potentially come to an end today with their loss to Wake Forest in the ACC tournament. They won a game in the first round of the ACC tournament yesterday. They lost 72-59 to to Wake Forest, a team they beat a, a couple of weeks ago at home. Um, how do you feel about this season now that it is potentially over with a 13-20 and record in Micah Shrewsbury's first year? Um, Honestly... I feel like this season was a success. They got to the turn ACC tournament. They won a game in the ACC tournament. And then they got to a 5-12 matchup today. And on paper, you would say that they should probably lose that game. Did I still think that they had a shot of beating Wake Forest today? Sure. But I didn't think that they realistically should beat Wake Forest. And I didn't realistically think that they'd have an above 500 record in the conference, an overall record etc and then when, when you start looking in terms of like master plan i would say that notre dame is ahead of schedule because i really didn't expect like a potential winning season until year three and i think that's a usual year for for any sport one year you're kind of because i mean you can't you can't take marcus freeman as the example because a lot of programs when you enter as a head coach it's for reasons of the team was probably bad and they had to get you know fire get rid of a coach and so your job is to come in and make things better. And that's kind of unfortunately what happened with the men's team and Mike Bray is, you know, Shrewsbury had a lot to clean up. So I didn't realistically think this thing would just get turned around in year one or year two, really. But I think that there is a good expectation or good chance that they could be an above 500 team next year and potentially a bubble team on getting into the NCAA tournament. So I feel really good about them being ahead of schedule and I feel really good about them establishing, you know, kind of their foundational, you know, how we're going to play, you know, in terms of defense, effort, et cetera. And now we can kind of start improving, you know, the scoring and the shooting and those sort of things. So I think they're ahead of schedule and I, I feel great about it because I think we're going to see, you know, we're going to see a new era of basketball at Notre Dame. I think you're going to see a type of offense um, and scoring that we haven't seen at Notre Dame in a while. It's just going to take a little bit of time. 
you saw the kind of positive signs that you wanted to see from this team. Somebody said yesterday, I think, that the team at the end of the season that Notre Dame had would have beaten the team at the beginning of the season by 50 points or something to that effect. And I think that that's probably right. They made the kind of incremental, like there were stretches, like in, like during that, during, you know, like in January, during that losing streak, it's like, man, can this team score at all? And, you know, then it started coming around. And you look at the fact that Marcus Burton ends up being the ACC Rookie of the Year. And a lot of people were down on, uh, you know, young Shrewsbury for shooting too much, you know, early in the season. And by the time it was all said and done, he was a much more consistent shooter. These were all, just not all, but they were, by and large, it was just a very young and inexperienced team. And they figured a lot of things out. And as you said, Micah Shrewsbury laid the foundation for what he wants this program to be, built on defense, built on effort. And, you know, he he called the team out for lack of effort a couple of different times. And since that point, that's really when we've started to see this upswing and an improvement of play, you know, really since that happened, I think it was like late January when he called him out. So, you know, 13 and 20 on the surface, it doesn't look great, but when you, you know, kind of go micro and you look at how things improved over the course of the season and how much more they won at the end of the season, I think that there's nothing but positive expectations for this program going forward. You get a couple more scores, you know, continue to get a little bit more size in there. I think that they can be really good here within the next couple of years. And like you said, knocking on the door, maybe a bubble team for the tournament next year. If not even, you know, on top of the bubble a year from now. <laughs> DK says he's pissed because coach was talking natty before the season. I think DK has been talking to Vince about that. Remember Vince getting all upset talking about national championships during his introductory press conference. Fill in the blank. There's talk that the Chicago Bears could keep Justin Fields and draft Caleb Williams at number one. It would be blank if that happens. It would be outrageous if that <laughs> happens because you are inviting so much controversy, right? I'm, you know, I, I it's, it's funny, like if, if you think about this in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's the worst idea because I don't like drafting a young quarterback and throwing them to the fire immediately. Like look what look at what the Packers did with Jordan Love. Everyone just wrote Jordan Love off because he he sat behind Rodgers for two or three seasons and they allowed him to develop and learn. I think that's what Caleb Williams needs, but with how much, you know, all this talk around fields and the number one pick, like if they did that, you couldn't reasonably explain that to fans. Like we're going to hold on to Justin Fields while allowing Caleb Williams to develop in the background. Like I, again, I think it's the logical thing to do, but it makes sense. It makes more sense when you have a, like an actual, you know, like an Aaron Rodgers at quarterback, or well, that's a Dak Prescott thing. at quarterback, or you know who Jared Goff at quarterback, whoever it might be. Because that's the first thing I thought of as well when I thought of this was well, you know. It's like, on the one hand, it doesn't seem like this would be a really good situation. But then on the other hand, you did have the Packers. And, you know, the Packers drafted Jordan Love. And he sat for a couple of years behind Aaron Rodgers. But the biggest difference is there's like 15 years of age between Aaron right. Rodgers and Jordan Love. You know, one was, you know, Rodgers was going to have to leave at some point. And so they went out and they got Love late in the first round. You know, and they made that trade to do it. Whereas in the situation with Fields and Williams, there's like two years of age difference <laughs> between them, you know? So it's a lot different when you're talking about two young quarterbacks who are presumably, you know, one is supposed to be hitting his prime here pretty soon and another one just coming in the league. So I don't think that that would be the optimal situation. And, you know, there's all this talk that there's no market for Fields and, you know, it's probably accurate, you know, but I, I think what's probably more even more accurate is there's no market for fields because nobody wants to pay, you know, the draft, you know, the like a, a second or round or, you know, better whatever package of draft picks to get a guy 
like Justin Fields. I mean, the bottom line is the guy is 10 and 28 as a starter. And you can blame the system. You can blame the talent around him, even though they went out and got DJ Moore last year. They had better talent around him. The guy was a first round pick three years ago. The same draft, and you brought up Jordan Love, the same draft as Jordan Love. And Love looked better as a first year starter after sitting two years last year than the guy with more experience, Justin Fields, right. did, you know, regardless of who your offensive coordinator is. So I can't see them keeping, I can't see the Bears keeping both guys. You know, my guess is this this could walk like right up until draft night and somewhere in the middle of draft night where where either Fields gets traded or you know the pick gets traded, whatever it happens to be. If they finally like it's it's in the Bears interest to play it obviously as close to the vest as possible. Keep everything, hold on to all your options because all it does is turn into a better bargaining chip for you, I think, down the road. So that's that's what I think is going to happen. Some either the pick gets moved or fields gets moved at some point. And you know, again, it might take right up until draft night before it all happens. Yeah, and honestly with the Bears contemplating this, it's st- it just shows to me that they want to draft Caleb Williams, but they can't pawn Justin Fields off for nearly enough yeah. that they can get. And so they're they're almost like, how can we, you know, how can we build back up Justin Fields' interest? What can we do in order to get, you know, something in, in return or exchange um for Justin Fields? So it it's really felt like, you know, they haven't done anything to help themselves out. They've allowed Justin Fields to become the scrutiny or the scapegoat. Now they want to to trade said scapegoat and get something out of him. Well, it's like we well, are also the same organization that is contemplating whether or not he's even you know an NFL quarterback. So what right. would make other teams interested in picking up someone like himself, right? So like exactly. you're not doing anything to help. How are you giving him any value? Yeah, right. That's right. And so the more you hold on to him, again, I think it's like we're not getting enough value out of him. So what can we do to potentially build his value back up? Right. I just I I can't see any way that they're both on the same roster next year. But in the meantime, you've got a lot of other moves being made. Um one of them being Sam Darnold going to Minnesota. Do you buy or sell him as the answer at quarterback in the post Kirk Cousins era with the Vikings? I do not buy him as the next quarterback in Minnesota, and I'm really interested to see you know, what Minnesota's overall plan is here because they clearly didn't want to pay Kirk Cousins. I think Kevin, is it Kevin McConnell is the head coach or O'Donnell? O'Donnell. I think he's a little bit, I think his ego, he pumps his ego up a little bit. I think he thinks he can win with just about like any quarterback, right? Like, I think he's like, oh, you know, I can, I get like, like he can, he's trying to basically do what San Francisco has done in Minnesota, being like, you know, I don't need a top end quarterback being an offensive guy in order to win. And so I don't know what the answer is at Minnesota. I think they're going to like piece something together and then, you know, just get a bunch of guys like Sam Darnold, make it a quarterback competition and basically say whoever wins, wins type situation. But to me, a more interesting concept would be. Like if the Vikings draft a quarterback this season and like say someone like Jaden Daniels fell to Minnesota with like Justin Jefferson and, you know, Addison, Jordan Addison at wide receiver. Like I think that they could potentially go the draft route this season to go along with the Sam Darnold and and whoever else they get in into training camp. And that's what I think it's got to be. And like they're sitting there at number 11. They're, They're just outside the top 10. So they're obviously not high enough to sort of control their own destiny. Would they, would they try to trade up? I think it's going to depend on what quarterback is there. Like how much, how much does O'Connell potentially cover it? You know, just about every Notre Dame fans, least favorite quarterback, JJ McCarthy, (laughs) you know, that's a guy who I also think might end up in Minnesota. That's that's what I'm saying. Like, like picking at number 11, that's a guy who could potentially, you know, be in that range and end up, in Minnesota and maybe they trade up a couple of spots, you know, to, to, you know, with somebody, you know, into the top 10 to try to get him, you know, I think that is a distinct possibility. And like, because when I saw Darnold, it's like, I I thought 
kind of initially what Father David was saying. It's like, let the tank, let the tank begin. And that's kind of what it seemed like. But they have been somewhat active on the defensive side of the ball, you know, addressing, you know, defensive guys with free agency and stuff like that. So they're trying to get better on defense, but then they go out and get a guy like Darnold. I thought Josh Dobbs played fairly well when they made the trade for him after the, the Cousins injury last year. Now, the team didn't show it, but they also had, you know, horrible running backs and, you know, nothing like there was uh, basically other than Justin Jefferson. And remember, Justin Jefferson was, was hurt for a good chunk of the season last year as well. I guess they had Jordan Addison, who turned out pretty good. But, you know, that's the thing. Like, whatever quarterback that they have is going to have a couple of pretty good, you know, one excellent wide receiver and another pretty good wide receiver they need to address the running back the offensive line isn't horrible I, I think that they're going to end up trying to to draft a quarterback they're either at number 11 I mean, they or, have or TJ trading Hawkinson the at tight end as well remember they traded with the Lions right. to get TJ Hawkinson so it's like they have a solid wide receiver and um you know tight end room and I'm glad you brought this up Bryce says drafting McCarthy would be a huge mistake listen Bryce I, I was not high on McCarthy myself, but I watched the entire um, NFL Network day of the quarterbacks at the Combine. And you know what everyone talked about was JJ how McCarthy, McCarthy <laughs> could be passing Jaden McDaniels. Like, they're basically saying, you know, one and two is set. Jaden Daniels. You keep right. adding and subtracting, like, mix and O's and <laughs> yeah. whatever else. Yeah, long day, guys. but <laughs> Williams and May are one and two, and I've heard a lot of conversation that McCarthy – could be the number three guy, right? Like, and they they have him ahead of Penix. They have him ahead of Milton. Like, he is the guy. It, it's going to be either Daniels or McCarthy at three or four. And, you know, I I like to think I know a lot about football, but when all of these NFL guys are consistently saying, you know, McCarthy is on a lot of people's radars, he's got to be doing something, right? They love him. I know. I know. So it's, I, he's going to go in the first round. It's just a matter of where he goes at this point. Fill in the blank. New Washington Commanders offensive coordinator Cliff Kingsbury is blank. Is making me nervous because the Commanders <laughs> have been the doormat of the NFC East for a good time now. And not only is their new head coach, the Cowboys ex-defensive coordinator, but Said defensive coordinator is slowly bringing along some of those guys from Dallas that he liked. You know, Washington's got some some good draft picks. And now you bring in, you know, a, a guy who is a really good offensive coordinator, or at least, you know, a respected offensive mind. It just kind of makes you nervous as an NFC division rival that, you know, Washington could be on the track of, of turning things around here. Maybe I'll end up eating my words. But I just think Cliff Kingsbury is so overrated as an <laughs> offensive coordinator. Look, you know, a timeline of Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury's ascension, you know, in the minds of, of the football world. His stock goes through the roof in 2012 when he's coaching Johnny Manziel at Texas A&M and Manziel wins the Heisman. Okay, so he parlays that into a head coaching job at Texas Tech where he has Two winning seasons. The first season that he had, eight and five was his best year. He becomes head coach there. He's got both Baker Mayfield and Patrick Mahomes on the roster. 2013, he goes eight and five. Mayfield is a part-time player. Mahomes isn't even playing yet. Mayfield ends up transferring to Oklahoma the next year. And so in two years with Patrick Mahomes as his starting quarterback, he wins a grand total of 12 games in two seasons with Mahomes as his starting quarterback. He gets fired after 2018, after three straight losing seasons. But guess what happens? It's 2018. Do you know what happened in 2018? Patrick Mahomes threw 50 touchdowns with the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> so all of a sudden, because Cliff Kingsbury was attached to Patrick Mahomes five years earlier, he goes from getting fired as the Texas Tech head coach. He was almost going to be, remember, on the USC staff, but he turns it instead into a head coaching gig with the Cardinals where he gets to draft his own quarterback. He goes and gets his guy, Kyler Murray, just a year after the Cardinals had drafted Josh Rosen in the first round, but they throw Rosen to the ditch 
and they, you know, because he picks his, he handpicks his quarterback. How good was, you know, Kyler Murray had his flashes, but he goes nine games under 500 in four years with the Cardinals, gets fired one year at USC. Caleb Williams regresses in that one year, and now he's the offensive coordinator back in the NFL again with the Washington Commanders. Again, maybe I'll eat my words because they're going to play the Cowboys twice a year, but I just really think that his his star has been attached to two guys, Johnny Manziel and Patrick Mahomes, and he really hasn't proven within a, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that he really deserves all the credit that he has gotten over the course of his career, all because of those two guys. I agree. And a lot of people in the chat have uh, pointed out, along with what you're saying, he is failing up. Yep. That's what I agree. That's what I think as well. You know, it's just like his name was attached to those two guys. Just like any guy for a couple of years who was attached to Sean McVay was going to become, you yeah. know, either a coordinator or a head coach someplace. So, like I said, maybe I'll eat my words and he'll prove otherwise. But I just, I haven't seen it so far. It hasn't been, maybe, and maybe he'll be better as a coordinator than he was as a head coach. But again, it's not like Caleb Williams, you know, it would have been hard for Caleb Williams to take another step up based on the first year that he had, but didn't look great in his season with Cliff Kingsbury. All right. Um, Omar wants to know why the Cowboys. You're bringing this one in, huh? Let Derrick Henry go to Baltimore. And it's just. Jerry All in. Just cheapskate, man. All they in. Just, they don't go the free agency route. They re-sign their own guys. And they just, you know, they, they re-sign their own guys and they go the draft route. They, you know, we'll see. We'll see if they can fill the holes that they need. The Listen, draft. the Cowboys are going right. to draft a running back, and I'm just praying that it's Audra Gestime. I actually like the moves that they made last year, like when they went out and they got Gilmore and they got Brandon Cooks. It took them half the year to finally figure out that they could throw to Brandon Cooks and you know, right. like include him in the offense. Gilmore, they would have been they would have been completely lost defensively if they hadn't gone out and got Gilmore last year. But those are two of the bigger moves that they've ever made, and those weren't necessarily free agency. As well, there were trades, you know, involved. So I there. um so. I heard something today. I'll send this to you. Well, you know, when I was listening to it, I actually decided not to send it to you because I knew it, it would upset you. But um, I was listening to a Rich Eisen uh, today, and he did a segment on this. And basically what he said is, you know, everyone's coming back to this Jerry Jones comment of all in. And Rich Eisen believes the interpretation of all in. And, and this is, you know, what he's heard around the combine and being around, you know, a lot of NFL people is he thinks that Jerry's version of all in is not restructuring Dak's contract and basically saying they are all in with Dak. This is Dak's situation to figure out and handle going in to the season. And and then, so I don't know how much again, validity there is to that, but that's what he, he is being viewed as all in is Jerry's stubbornness to not rework Dak's deal and allow him to, you know, essentially ride out with the situation. Because if the Cowboys redid Dak's deal, they'd free up a lot of money to go get other pieces elsewhere. Right. But instead of not restructuring, it's like, okay, Dak, the load is on your shoulders. So he's saying figure it out. it's all in on this season to yes. get it done. So he's basically putting it all on Dak. Is yes. what Rich Eisen is saying. Yes. Well, if that's the case, and then I don't think that, that that's the way to go. But I mean, did we? expect anything less yes tyler evans they do need to release michael gallup and remember a couple of years ago when they traded amari cooper they decided you know they traded away amari cooper when michael gallup was coming off an injury and they were basically saying that and then they re-signed i think they franchise did they franchise dalton schultz for that year of yeah. whom of course they've since let walk but they they basically were justifying trading away Cooper's salary by keeping Michael Gallup and Dalton Schultz for that year and like in the aggregate their vision was those two guys were going to be more productive 
than Amari Cooper. Yeah, and both those guys aren't going to be on and the roster next out? season. Right, right, so. exactly. That's all you had to do is wind us up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's going to do it for tonight. Again, Vince will be in here tomorrow. Jesse, your last show for the week, but I will see you soon. Jesse's heading into uh, South Bend for uh, birthday shenanigans this weekend. So I will see you soon. Yes, I have a lot of things to get packed up, but I will be arriving this evening. All right. Sounds good. Hit the like button before you leave. Subscribe, rate, and review. And we will talk to you on Thursday on IB Nation Sports Talk.